Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. My name is Mark Patterson, former NFL player, now climbing the seven summits, and welcome to another amazing podcast. I love this quote. This comes from a guy by the name of Bob Cousy. He was a all-world guard out of Boston for the Boston Celtics, and he said this, do your best when no one is looking. If you do that, then you can be successful at anything that you put your mind to. I think that pretty much sums things up for my guest this week. His name is Blair Kellison, and he is the CEO of Traditional Medicinals. So if any of you out there are tea drinkers like I am, I've actually never had a cup of coffee, then you will love their product line. And he's been now at the helm for many, many years. He took over for the uh, the original founder, and they make all these amazing uh, teas, cup of sunshine, cup of calm, chamomile with lavender, all these other ones. And uh, just loved having this guy on the pod. He really gets it. You know, he's a guy that was going down the path of, of, of being a CPA and working for some big companies. And he didn't, he didn't feel like that was his, his path. And so he really went out and put his toes on the, on the line and uh, jumped and jumped into the fear and fear of the unknown and taking a big pay cut. And ultimately, that has led to him being the CEO uh, since 2008, and they've gone through explosive growth. And the beauty about all this is that he really is a mission-driven health and wellness guy, and he wants to really broadcast his message back to the youth of America and others that will listen through his public speaking uh, all about go and, and really feed that passion in life and don't be held accountable to just what you think you have to do, but really what you want to do. And that's what um, all of us should be doing in life. So anyways, amazing podcast with with Blair. He's a beauty and really enjoyed it. So we'll get to him in just a minute. And as always, I wanted to let everybody know about my e-learning course called Finding Your Summit, which is located on my website called www.markpattisonnfl.com. There is a free PDF and assessment that you can get of really how you can get off the sidelines and back into life. That's how I got to where I am today. Really, that came from my my Hall of Fame coaches uh, many years back through the Pyramid of Success. So I'm very grateful for that. And now I'm trying to pay it forward by having those things on my website you can also find out what I'm doing in terms of the next 12 months, really training hardcore towards Mount Everest. Next March, I will be taking off next March or April 2020, so I'm totally jacked up about that. And if you haven't done so already, please go to iTunes and rate and review. It really helps create more awareness in the Apple world as sharing stories of people doing amazing things inspires us all. And by the way, if you can't wait for the next episode to drop, be the first one to listen to Finding Your Summit pod on a new podcast player called Himalaya. Check that out. Okay? So finally, this pod is sponsored by Violets or Blue Skincare with Cynthia Bestman. She is the creator. She's amazing. She's a rock star. She's overcome her own adversity. Love her and what she is doing. Okay? So that's it. Let's go listen to the pod. Here we go. Hey, everybody, it's me, Mark Patterson, back again with another awesome episode of Finding Your Summit. And this week, I'm really jacked up to have this guy on the pod because he certainly has found his way in doing something that he's very passionate about in life, as well as helping others along the way. His name is Blair Kellison. Blair, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me today. Hey, listen, I'm beaming all the way from Sun Valley, Idaho, and you're somewhere outside the county of Sonoma, which is a beautiful area in alone. And I've been up to Napa several times, but man, from a from a guy born in the Northwest, making your all the way out to the West Coast, it's been an incredible story. Yep, I grew up. Uh, I'm, I'm basically a, a Midwestern. Uh, I'm, I'm an overachieving B student from the Midwest. <laughs> well, you've done well for yourself. So <laughs> I want I want to give the audience a, a setup here a little bit. So you are currently the CEO of Traditional Medicinals, and I actually was sipping on a cup of organic chamomile with lavender right here. Wow. You the boss. Awesome. Love yeah, it. no, I love this stuff. And so when I got the opportunity to uh, to interview you, you know, you're talking to a guy who's never had a cup of coffee. I'm from 
the great city of Seattle and spent a lot of time down at Starbucks, but again, never had that temptation. Temptation, And I've just always just had an affinity for natural cheese and things that can actually help you in life and calm you down and get your head clear, especially when things aren't going so well. So everybody knows Seattle for its coffee, but it's actually the highest per capita consumption city for tea in the United States. Wow, that's incredible. Well, you can count me as one of those guys who maybe <laughs> possibly started the movement. So look, uh, your your story, story has a lot of twists and turns to it. And I know your your background is a little interesting to me, at least, because you're a former CPA and you got your MBA from the University of Chicago in finance. And, and somehow or another, you found your way in business development and doing some other things in life. And it didn't seem like that's the direction that your heart was going in. And so you ended up taking a big haircut and transitioning out of something that probably was feeding you a fairly good life and, you know, really wanted to go to more of a mission-driven health and wellness company. And that's what you did. I did. So I started out pretty traditional background, first generation to go to college. You go to college, get a job. Counting seemed like a thing I can get a job in. And a big lesson I learned there is just because you're good at something doesn't mean you like it. I was a pretty good accountant, passed the CPA exam, but you know what? I really didn't like it and uh, decided I wanted to, to do something more like marketing, a little more personal. So I got an MBA marketing, made my way to the West Coast from the Midwest, then to work for Nestle in, uh, in Los Angeles, California. But even with my sort of CPA, MBA Best career move I ever made when I was uh, about 31 years old and I was living in Los Angeles, I walked into the 19th Street Natural Foods Co-op. Never been in a food co-op ever in my whole life. So all these like wonderful vegan, vegetarian, mission-driven, healthy, organic companies that I didn't even know they existed and just fell in love with the whole thing. Everybody at work started calling me the MBA granola head. (laughs) Like all good granola heads in 1995, I took a 70% pay cut, went to work for a vegetarian food company. I, well, I just, that was the highest and best uses of my talents was to get these products, which were really wonderful, out into the public's uh, knowledge. I, I think a lot of times it gets down to the golden handcuffs, right? Where we all want to do something that is is mission-driven, that really gives back. And especially when you start talking about the food chain in this whole Action creates reaction because you're not just talking about on, on, on going north, so to speak, in terms of feeding people with excellent food, but also about the farmer, the growers that are, are behind of really making sure that they can do what they do in the right ways without taking shortcuts and making sure they are, are, are organic and, and, and natural and they don't have pesticides and everything else on them. And so, you know, when that rubber meets the road, it's just a lot of people say they want to go do something and, and work for charities or do things like you did, but they can't just because they, it's the wife and the kid and then the house, and the mortgage and all these other things. W- was there a breaking point where you were just literally all 10 toes on the bridge and you just had to jump? You know, here's where it kind of came to be. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a B student. I was a B student in college. I was a B student in high school. I was a B student in MBA. So I, I felt really lucky that I ever got to work at a company like Ernst & Young in accounting. And I felt really lucky that I ever got to work at a company like Nestle in marketing. But you know what? And there's a lot of smart people in those companies. But I was sort of always in the middle of the pack. There was always the smart people who were running those organizations. And I, I really kind of felt like, you know what, I don't know if I'm any good at marketing. I, I don't even know if I if this is the right career choice for me. I know I can't market a product I don't eat. So I got to at least get myself into a place that's that, that I'm marketing something that I believe in. And then I'll see whether I'm any good at marketing. I think that's really what drove me was my mediocre, mediocrity at, at my company. Yeah. In my career, you know, I was just kind of floating around doing OK, but wasn't going anywhere big. Well, it's amazing when you kick in that little thing called why, you know, why are you doing this? Yeah, and yeah. you really get driven about, I mean, I, I say this all the time in terms of tying this back into mountain climbing or the professional sports you used to play. I mean, there's just too many hard days of training and going along. If you don't have a very strong why for why you were actually doing these things, it's just too easy to quit, you know, along the, along the path. Yeah. So I'm sure that no, if, that, if I'm, Found my people, found my products, and then you know I never, I've never looked back since then. And, one, and once you do that, once you once you get yourself into a meaningful job, you can't go to something that's not meaningful ever again. Yeah, I mean, look, there, there's there's like in your case when you're talking about the, you know the company that we're talking about here today that you've been the CEO of now since I think 2008. Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a heck of a run uh, for anybody. And, and I'd love to hear about your distribution and, and where you go. I just know that when I walk into Whole Foods, Natural Grocers, those other places, and I, if you were to see my cupboard, most people have it stock full of coffee and coffee beans and creamers and all that kind of stuff. And I've got my multiple boxes of all this great stuff. And you've come up with all these, these great taglines. I don't know if that was part of your marketing genius or somebody else's, but a cup of sunshine, a cup of calm. And, you know, I'm looking at this chamomile with lavender, right? But when you really dig, you, you turn the box around, you really read the ingredients. Not only are you listing those ingredients, but you're also kind of giving some inspiration around what those things do and how they can really help you through whatever you're going through on that particular day. Right. We're, we're really, we're, we're selling botanical wellness. It just happens to be a cup of tea, but, but we're not, we're not selling black tea or, or, uh, or green tea. We're we're really selling. We're an herbal. We're an herbal wellness company that's kind of disguised as a tea company. So, but I tell you, the I, I you work hard in your life. There's a famous saying: the harder you work, the luckier you get. And I really got lucky coming to this company because the company had been in existence for 34 years, founded by a wonderful guy named Drake Sadler, and he had owned it and run it for 34 years. And it got to the point in uh, 2008 where he felt like it had gotten bigger than him. And he needed to, to kind of bring somebody in to run it who had already sort of been to where the company was going. And uh, it's, it's really been an honor to have this job and to go work, for, to have a family and a person who spent 34 years doing something to turn it over to you. Is, it's really an honor. I'm more of a steward of this brand than I am anything else. It, it, it was at a hard transition because a lot of times when you have a founder, right, that, that has taken their baby and grown that into something. And then now the next guy comes along and you, you see this all the time where there's this conflict, right, yeah. uh, uh, between the new CEO and, and the, the founder that happened with Howard Schultz and some other guys yeah. that he brought in along the way. What was that transition for you? Sure. So I think that it, the, the success of those transitions are all about each of the two individuals. So you, you've got to, as, as, a, as a founder, you got to be able to let go. You got to know that somebody else is going to do the stuff that you did different than you. doesn't mean it's not as good or maybe even better, but it's surely different. And so I give Drake a lot of credit for even putting his hand up and saying, you know what, I, I've taken this as far as it can go and, and, and I need someone else to help me. And then I think on my end, you've got to come in and realize this is not your, you never, you didn't start this company. You're never going to be the founder of it. You stand on the shoulders of not just the founder, but you stand on the shoulders of all the work that's come before you. So I, I've been the first non-founder CEO of four companies now. So I've done this transition four times. So I had a lot of experience at it. And I've really learned kind of how to do it. And a lot of it is just having respect, having a stewardship approach to it, having a, a servant leader approach and saying that like this person's handing this to me. And it, it, I, 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 uh, uh, one of my references said, hey, you know how you got that job? One of the days when you were interviewing, you were on the front porch and you were saying goodbye to Drake, the, the, the founder. And I said to him and I meant it. I said, you know, Drake, I know you're not Vincent Van Gogh. But God damn it, I know this is your, this is your starry night and I will love it and protect it and cherish it and, and never let anything happen to it. And he said, that's the day he decided you were the guy to hire. So it's not about my accounting and marketing and production skills. It was about my demeanor. It was about my trust and my honesty and my integrity. Well, it seems to me, look, you've been there since 2008 and certainly you got to be able to play well with others to make it that long in terms of being the CEO and having that transition roll over like that. But there, there's got to be some other point of difference that you bring to the table. I, I know you're being very humble about it and just beyond just getting along and, and, and having a, a background in finance. But there must have been, you know, where your leadership now starts to kick in. And, and I also I put that and I want to get into this a little bit, where you do travel around the country, you do do some public speaking and really try to help uh, younger kids really with their direction in life in terms of really trying to align their skills, their passions into something that they can do and monetize in their life. So what was that thing? What was that thing for you? Well, can, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think that here's the thing. They, a lot of companies are, are founded by, the, well, they're all founded by founders. And these founders typically are not your typical person. They're not your typical business person with a typical business background. And so uh, Drake Sadler is a self-proclaimed hippie. Uh, he spent 1967 in Golden Gate Park in the summer of love, made his way up to Sonoma County, met an herbalist, fell in love. They started an herbal tea company. Like he's not like a business person. And so the people with my background generally have a harder time going. And, and, and then these companies get started. They have no money. They're small. 
So they're, they're kind of cobbling together people at low salaries and they're, they're just trying to make it. And when, and when I came to the company as 34th year, it was of a size where it could attract a CEO. But then what I was able to do was go out in the world and find a background who would come and work for someone like me because they could relate to me like, oh, Blair worked at Ernst Young, Blair worked at Nestle, and now he's really happy at this herbal tea company. Maybe it's not so funky and, and, and crazy. Maybe it's actually a real business opportunity. And, and, and then the other thing that is huge is people want it. People want to know a company's why. So what's really driving people right now in the workforce is I want to do I want to do meaningful work for a meaningful company. And we have that at this company in spades. So I went out and hired MBAs and marketing and sales and finance and operations people from large CPG companies that would have never dreamed of coming to work at a company like traditional medicinals. But because because I was there and then my team was there. And the why was so strong there. And then they not only come here, but then the, where the magic happens in your career is when you line up your skills with your passions and then the engagement they have in your just explodes. And so Nestle's getting 60, 70% of their MBA's mind engagement when they're working with them. They come to work for our company. We get 95% of them and they're coming up with great ideas and great processes and great ways to do things. And they're just so fully engaged and so fully alive here because of our why. And, and so it's it's not about the business skills that makes us. I think competition today is not between products, but between business models and our forward thinking, sustainable business model that is enriching the world as we grow is really attractive to workers. I, I'm trying to understand if you guys were on the front end of this or you ran a parallel path. So when you go into a Whole Foods today, right, which is where you can get yep. your different various products. They've they've really turned a corner and tell, trying to tell that former story. You know, when you go into the different pro- produce, the, these are where these carrots came from. This is yes. where this ca- cauliflower come from. And 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 when I'm I've got this box in my hand, I'm looking at this. And again, there's personality, there's herbal power, there's reasons to love, there's taste. So you guys, in a sense, are doing the exact same thing. Were you in front of that trend? Or- the company was uh, our company was always in front of that. Our company was founded in 1974 by a, a self-proclaimed hippie and a third, a fourth generation herbalist to connect people to the power of plants to change lives, to change the lives of the people who are growing these plants all over the world, and to change the lives of the people who are drinking these efficacious wellness teas. And, and they started that a long time ago, 1980. I think our fifth, 1979, our fifth year of business. Our founder and, and, and Rosemary, the, the two co-founders, they were buying herb, uh, lemongrass from a, an herb supplier in San Francisco. And it, and it had a big stamp on the side of the bag. It said, from Guatemala. And they asked the guy, can you find out what the, where this farm is in Guatemala? We want to go visit them. And so they did. And they got on a plane and they flew to Guatemala. And they went and found this farm. And then the story is they drove in and the lemongrass was three feet tall. It was the most beautiful lemongrass I'd ever seen. And Rosemary Herbalist was like going gaga over that. And Drake was looking forward and looking at the squalor, these little tin shacks that people were living in going, hey, we can't buy lemongrass for people who are living in a tin shack like that without running water. That's not fair. I'm not going to make money off exploiting these people. And that was the beginning of them really realizing that we've got to connect both ends. We've got to connect this family who's growing this lemongrass with this lady who's buying this at Whole Foods. We have to make the whole connection. We have to have an equitable supply chain. So my sense is by the time you came in in 2008, the company was humming at a, at a certain pace, a certain rate. And that's the reason why they brought you in. But in the early days, going back to the stories that I'm sure you heard, what was it with Drake, if you're talking about a couple of self-proclaimed hippies hanging out in San Francisco and you know all those different things that was going on in that period of time, how did they make that transition? Because there wasn't a Whole Foods and there wasn't, I mean, it was still kind of more of the mass markets that were, that were there. How did they find their way, their space in terms of trying to turn this thing into a profitable company? You know, it was really, it's a really hard go. And they're, they're very typical of a lot of companies that started in the 70s. There was hardly any distribution. There was hardly any products. There was, it was really hard to connect the consumer with the products. These little co-ops were showing up all over the place. There wasn't even a national distributor. There was no national chain selling this. And so it just really kind of grew organically. And, and they, they slowly uh, some stores got together and formed little chains. And slowly some of the little local distributors formed together and created distribution networks. And 
But even in 19, uh, or even in 2008, when I came to the company, we were essentially sold in health and natural food stores. Now, those became places like um, Whole Foods, and they were much more organized than like, and we were still in all the co-ops. But the big transition for the company has been to move to Safeway and Target and Walmart and, and sell and, and basically sell our tea right next to every place you can buy a box of Lipton tea. That's yeah. been the big transformation for the company is accessibility. You don't have to go to this funky natural foods co-op in your town to buy traditional medicinals now. You can just go to your local Safeway or Walmart or Target. So in terms of the competition that's out there, and that's what you're talking about. So now you're 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 going into some of these different distribution places, like you said, Walmart, the you know, I mean, have some some huge reach. Have other people come in and try to squash you guys along the road, along the way, or the or the bigger boys? Like I, I'm I'm citing a, a bad example here, but but the Starbucks of the world, maybe that is a good example where they brought in, they've acquired a, a tea company, where they're now trying to compete with you guys. Yep, they they uh, they own Tazo, so they they ran Tazo for a long time. Uh, Unilever, Tazo, Houston, and then there's Bigelow Tea, Celestial's owned by a big company um, yeah. as well, and so. We're competing with them, but but everybody and everybody who's in the tea category has come out with a line of wellness teas to compete with us. Yeah. And, and yet, as we go through time, we are we in our in our in our forty fourth year, we're the fastest growing tea company in the United States. We are the fourth largest tea company in the United States, and we're perceived by rightly so by consumers to be the most authentic in this category of herbal medicinal tea. And so as the category grows, we're leading that growth. And yes, there's other people doing what we're doing, but we've been doing it and doing it well for, for 44 years now. And, and consumers recognize that authenticity. And then they really like our why. We're buying, a this is a great statistic, but we're buying about 120 herbs from a herbs in 40 countries on six continents. And we're all organic all medicinal grade, and most of them are all fair trade as well. So even though there's a, a million pounds of chamomile out there in the world, less than 50,000 pounds, less than 5% will qualify for traditional medicinals. And that most of our growers have been with us for decades. We buy 100% of everything they grow, bringing all that into Sonoma County, and we're formulating into these teas and stripping it out. It's a very unique supply chain that we have. We have a 1,000 kids that are going to go to school today in India, one of five schools that Traditional Medicinals owns and operates in its growing regions. We've built, bought the land, built the building, hired the teachers, given the kids uniforms, bicycles to get there, a hot lunch every day. We invest $2 million every year in our supplier communities across these 40 countries. That's awesome. That's just awesome. But it's not it's not charity. It's an investment. It's an investment in our supply chain. You know, I know I get all that. I mean, again, it's going back to that story that you're talking about where the guy is growing these amazing herbs and and but yeah, he's in a tin shack and really understanding right. that if you empower them in the right way, that you can actually create them in a sustainable environment that you're helping them, they're helping their community, and then it, it's helping you as well. So everybody, it's a win win. Can you imagine if you're growing senna in the Rajasthan desert? It's an ingredient that's in one of our best-selling teas. And this company comes in and starts buying your senna. And then they build a well in your front yard so you don't, your kids don't have to walk for water anymore. And then they build a school right down the street. And then your, your kids get a bicycle and a uniform. And all of a sudden, your kids are going to school in a place that's never had a school ever. Like, that, that creates a lot of loyalty for us. Oh, it, it's incredible. I mean, this is this is a separate story, but I'm involved in Water Boys, and so I've I've mentioned this numerous times on this on the show. But Chris Long, who plays for the Philadelphia Eagles, started this a couple of years ago. But essentially, he was going down to Tanzania, which I did with him, and and climb Kilimanjaro and create awareness. But uh, with all of the idea of raising money, which which we did, forty seven thousand dollars I raised personally. Uh, along with my buddy Jim Mora, and we built a, a water well. And it's all about the same thing you're talking about, yeah. that you go into these these villages of the Maasai tribe, and you're building just, it's a, that's all it is, it's a water well. So kids don't have to walk four or five right. miles with a bucket of, of five-gallon bucket on their head. And, and mostly uh, these people are, are young girls, and they get attacked. And, you know, it's awful, and in and, and awful water, and, and it's dirty and everything else. So really transforming those communities into something that's sustainable that benefits everybody in the chain. So it's, it's, it's fantastic. Now, have you been to all these different distribution sources? 
I haven't been to a lot of them. I've got young kids, so I'm, I'm running the company, not traveling around the world. But our founder, Drake Sadler, is in these communities quite a bit. And his wife is in India probably three months a year, every year, maybe even four months a year. So we, as a company, we have a lot of people in these communities. But another point I want to make about what you just said is like people refer to us as a social business and we have this social business model. The reality is every single company in America is a social business. It's people operating together. They're they're doing something together. They're buying things that come from places that people grow. Like every business is a social business. And I, I look forward to the day when we're not called out for doing something nobody else is doing and everybody is doing it because it, it we are the consumers today should demand that every product they buy is coming from a business that's doing the right thing. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I well, just listening to what you just said, it, it, there's there's one component of being every business is a social business and every business pretty much has some kind of supply chain to it. But what you guys are doing, it's more socially responsible and really being conscious about all the different pieces and parts along that 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 chain. Hey, this pod is sponsored by Laird Superfoods. So many products to choose from, from your InstaFuel, your coffee, your tea, your smoothies. And I love the superfood creamer and use the hydration powders like the beets, the coconut, the matcha, the turmeric to mix all into my seven summit smoothie. And it's so good. Log on to LairdSuperfood.com and get your 20% off when you use the code MARKP20. Okay. So get your layered superfood, and I guarantee it will help fuel your journey. But but I think everybody should, I guess, is what I'm saying. And I, and I love it that particularly the millennials are starting to demand that from the companies they buy. They, they're not just buying what they're buying. They're buying why it's made, and that's fantastic. Yeah, many years ago, I owned a company, and we did all the, the outdoor market umbrellas for Starbucks coffee. So we did those for 14 years. So if you can imagine those green ones uh, all over North America, South America, and in parts of Asia, and I'd go over to or these different factories in in uh, in China, and they'd have bars around um, the the factory. These kids, these, these people couldn't get out. Now they weren't in prison, but it was as much about keeping people from coming in as people leaving. And it was just like these things are being built, and that's great, and it's helping me, it's helping Starbucks, and yeah, I guess in some way these these people are all making money and wages, but it doesn't seem like a happy, awesome environment like the way you described your different employees coming in, you're really understanding the whole supply chain. So it's just not about a tea bag going out the door. It's all right. about, you know, also the people in the, in the back end. Our, 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 our employees are totally fired up. There's, they're just, they're really engaged. It's a wonderful group of people. I get to do interviews like this because I'm the CEO, but you got to think about really who's talking to you today is 240 people. And I'm just happened to be their spokesperson. So are you guys owned by a private equity group or? Investment? No, we're owned by the, the family that started our company, Drake Sadler. We're owned by his family. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, the reason why I ask you that question is because a lot of times they they bring in, a company grows to a certain space and along the way you had to take money and now you're really working, even though you may be the CEO or, 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 the, or the founder, you end up working actually for the investment group and then their their priorities and goals may not align many times because they want to sell the company and do other things for faster growth, which don't align with your, with your, um, with your foundation, your, your core values. But that's why I say our business model is a competitive advantage because we have a long-term multi-generational planning horizon. We're not looking at quarterly earnings. We're doing things that make sense in five years and 10 years. It's a real competitive advantage for us as a company and we're real, a well-run company. So just because we're mission driven and organic and fair trade doesn't mean we're going to uh, just lose money every year. We're competitive. We're the fourth largest tea company in the United States and we're competitive and we have good market share and we make a nice profit and that makes us financially sustainable and enables us to be able to do things without taking on investment capital. And that's a, that's a part that's overlooked by a lot of uh, kind of uh, socially responsible companies is the importance of financial sustainability. So you I, don't have to be sold. Yeah. And so as you go forward and look out, you know, what do you see as the threats? Our only, I'm in an envious position as a CEO. Our only threats are ourselves. It's just our, we, we have a, a 10 year new product pipeline. It's just our ability to execute, to be able to hire talented people and get them in here and get organized and do what we do. We're, we're, we're in a really nice position. So tell me what it is, transitioning just a little bit here, uh, tell me what it is about when you go talk to kids and trying to get them, what's the core message around trying to get them to align their talents 
and their goals around doing something that they actually are passionate about. I've got a daughter right now who graduated from USC and she's really trying to do that. Right. And it's just, it's, again, it kind of gets back to doing things that, that she wants to do, understanding what those things might be because she's still at a young age and at the same time trying to monetize her life in a way that she's not relying on mom or dad anymore. My, my core message to young people is around living a purposeful life. So finding, you know, there's a famous saying, the most, two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you figure out why you were born. So I really encourage young people to, to get out of their comfort zone, do things by themselves, travel, find ways to figure out who they are, what's important to them. And it could be a myriad of different things and align what they, what they do with their career with those things that they really like or they really feel passionate about. And it sounds so simple, but you know, I, I, do, I do a lot of career counseling. At, at the, I'll do a commencement address all the way up to counseling somebody who's 50 years old. But more times than not, I find where people go wrong in their careers is not from failing at their job, but from choosing the wrong job that wasn't lined up with what they want. It's like Blair, go, 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 majors in accounting, go, goes to work for an accounting firm. Well, that seems like a good job. You're a first generation kid. You can make good money doing that. And then six, seven years into it, here's what happens. You get out of college, you, may, you, you major in something, you get out of college and you start doing it and, and you get good at it because you're doing it. But it yeah. doesn't mean you like it. And so what happens is nobody ever trans, most people don't transition out of what they're good at over to what they like to do. And if you can put what you like to do in line with what you're good at, the, the, the stars align. And that's where I'm just always encouraging young people to, to go to companies that are doing something that's meaningful to them. That's less important than the actual job they have. And it's sure less important than the, the pay they get. I, 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 one of my big pieces of advice I get a lot of good feedback on is when you're at all the ages, but particularly when you're young, every Friday you get two paychecks. One is money. And one is experience. And so you really need to go to the job where you're going to learn the most that's aligned with who you are and getting those experiences and let that dictate the future of your life. Yeah, I love that. I, I think the other part of that too, and, and I'm, I'm speaking from personal experience now, is, is again, not being so sucked in that you have to, to, to live this dream that's on paper that everybody talks about and you get sucked into the, the white picket fence and 2.3 kids and all yeah. this stuff, yeah. right? And, and, and I, I it, and again, just pointing the gun right back at myself after going through my adversity seven, eight years ago, that the biggest thing I needed to do as I'm, you, as I was sitting there and thinking about all these different things, like how do I propel my life forward was really stepping into the fear. And I think a lot of times fear holds you back in terms of you start playing that, well, what if, and what if, and what if, and, and you can talk yourself out of doing anything. And, and without taking that step forward, you'll never know if you would have been great or what kind of things had, have come to you. And for this, for me, we talked about this before we went live here, the podcast, right? I mean, there was no podcast on, on this, this, this game plan I had. It was just more to get, get relief from my life and get into the mountains. And, and by starting this podcast a year and a half ago, I've been able to meet one guy or girl after another and, and been involved in all these amazing stories. And so this is now is turning into something more and more and more. But again, it's more about the passion of stepping into things and stepping in, into the fear. Yeah, I, think every, I think we're from a young age, we're, we're led to believe that it's all about how smart we are. It's all about what we learn. Uh, you know, I want I'm going to do good in high school. I'm going to get into a good college. I'm going to go do good in college. And I'm going to get a good job out of college. I'm going to I'm going to do really well at my work. But as you progress in your career, it is it is not about it is not about subject matter expertise. It's about your personality. I, I for me, I think the successful people have courage. They have kindness and they have humility. And it's it's the it's the subjective parts of who you are that enable you to be successful, not because you're the smartest guy. Uh, that's why, and I think study, you know, students do really well to a certain age. And then at some, sometime in your thirties, when leadership is, and, and, and managing other people start to be the most important thing, the B students start catching up and, and exceeding the A students. Cause we're, we're more adept at the, at the, at the, and we're more, uh, will more often have the courage and the kindness and the and, and the and the humility because we, we always knew people were smarter than us. So of course we're humble because we were always the B student. Yeah. We were always had our hand up. We we're always asking people questions and always collaborating. And when you're the smartest person in the room, you don't do that. 
And, and so I think that what people don't realize is it's just not about getting smarter and smarter at your craft. It's really about those personal qualities that make a le- leadership is, is, is much more about emotional intelligence than subject matter expertise. And that's a big difference. Yeah, I love that. I also saw something else that you, you, would, you put down, and this is something that's really hard to do. I don't think it's hard to do if you have those, those qualities that you talked about. But you know, when, you, when you start talking about hiring other really smart people, you're not threatened by having people that know more than you. And that's actually the sign of strength and confidence within yourself of bringing somebody in with better expertise in that particular area. And, and too often you see CEOs come along and they're threatened by that because they need to be the smartest guy in the room. And it doesn't have to be that way. It does not. And I, I, another thing I'm always telling young people is contrary to everything you're, hold, you're heard your entire life, vulnerability is a leader's greatest strength. It is not a liability. The people that can put their hand up and say, you know what, I'm a better leader than I am a marketing person or a finance person or accounting person. Somebody told me once when I was younger, hire people that are so smart, they scare you. That's a good what a good leader does. Yeah, no, I, I love all these things you're saying. And actually, we're, we are very much aligned in terms of how we see the world. And, and I, I don't think, and it took me 50 years to really figure this out about really opening up and sharing my story and who I am. And, and at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. And people don't judge you one way or the other. Actually, it, what's done it, it has made others open up even more to me based on telling and sharing my story about saying, you know, I don't have all the answers and I've fallen down and I hit my head a number of times and here's what it is. And it just seems that, I don't know. I mean, life is much more rich when you, which you, when you engage at that level, because that's what you get. You get to, you know, go further and further down and people really t- seem to open up and that's where the richness comes in. I'm a huge fan of this concept of servant leadership. A leader, I think a, a manager has people that work for them and a, and a servant leader has people that they work for. I mean, if you work, if you work for me and I meet with you on your weekly or biweekly meeting, I'm going to say, what, what do you need to do your job? What obstacles are you facing? How can I remove anything from you? What do you need to do your job? Because I, I'm not better at marketing than my marketing person. I'm not better at finance than my finance person. And that's the big difference between a leader and a manager. Managers manage and leaders lead. It's a huge difference between the two. You, a leader hires people smarter than them and their subject matter expertise and listens to them. Yeah, look, you're saying so many just really key things. And again, the name of this podcast is Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And sometimes it goes in both directions. It swings, right? Where you're imparting your knowledge and your experience and your humility to help others and bring them along, whether it's your employees or these various students that you meet with around the country in a mentorship type role. But flipping it around on the other side, where did you get that guiding light? (laughs) I probably got most of it from growing up in a wonderful Midwestern family as one of five kids with a mom and a dad who basically said, if you're if you're willing to work hard and you get a decent education and you're a nice person and you can engage with people, you can accomplish anything you set out to do in life. And that's probably my biggest example of that. Unfortunately, as a CEO, there aren't a lot of other CEOs I aspire to be like. Yeah. And, and, um, and so one of the reasons, so people, I was at a conference uh, just last week and somebody's like, what are you doing here? Why are you take? you're super busy. Why are you here? It was all young CEOs that were doing impact kind of companies. And I said, because you know, what happens is people get into a CEO position, then they get a little bit of success behind them, which I've been lucky to have. And then they just get a big ego and then they want to just go off and do big speaking things and, and write a book and tell everybody how great they are. I said, you know what I want to do with the rest of my life? I want, to, I want to go back as my 50-year-old self, and I want to put my arm around you, who I look at as my 20-year-old self. Yeah, no, that's, that's incredible. And, and, and that's just a great way to see life. And, and again, I, I believe that I, I've been around a lot of wealth, and I've been around a lot of people with giganto egos. And it, it's just so rewarding and to me enriching when you have people who really get it and it's all about as you said uh, you get to a certain point where you pay it forward and you're paying it back right and you're trying to help others along that same path because things just keep recirculating over and over and it's it's either great uh, leadership and mentorship or bad leadership and mentorship right no no it's it, it for me it's my greatest reward 
people want to thank me. And I'm like, no, just go out and, and show me someday that you lined up your dreams with your passions and your skills. That, that's my thank you. That's the thank you. All. I want to see that. Well, look, I'm uh, headed up to Mount Everest next year. And I'm, you know, as, as I started off the show here and we were talking about my love of, of tea and I'm hoping that you guys can come up with some new Seven Summit Lavender <laughs> <laughs> tea bag that I can take up there and, you know, wave around. And, and uh, yeah, so it, it's interesting, ironically, uh, in, in route to base camp from uh, uh, starting off in, in Kathmandu, uh, it's about a 14 day journey and you're hitting all these different tea huts. And oh, so uh, I'm uh, sure, yeah, they're herbal and, and they're supposed to be just magical experiences with the Nepalese people up there. They're so sweet and giving and humble uh, in their own way. So it's awesome. Hey, listen, where can people find you in terms of, of connecting if, if that's what somebody needs in their life right now to get some? Absolutely. I say at the end of all my speeches, uh, wherever, I drive to speech for, there's nothing that will be on the radio or a podcast that will ever be more interesting to me than talking to you about helping you align your passions with your career. So you can find me on LinkedIn. You can go to the traditional medicinals website and send an inf informational interview there and said, I heard Blair talk and he said I could contact you or connect with me on LinkedIn. And, and uh, if you do that, I would, I will offer to you that I will take the time to talk to you. Nothing would please me more. Awesome. Well, listen, uh, we will have all these things in the show notes. This pod will run in a couple of weeks. I'm going to sign off here in a second and go have a cup of sunshine. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I really appreciate you coming on the pod. You've been a, a beacon of, of, uh, of inspiration, really, you know, with all the different kind of words you've had to say and, and really paying it forward in the right way. So I appreciate it very much. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Bye. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Patterson, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, nfl.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye. Hey, thank you so much for dropping in and listening to another amazing episode of Finding Your Summit. Truly incredible people doing spectacular things in life. And I hope you were inspired just like I continue to be. Look, I am super grateful that you came in and subscribed to this pod and would be more than appreciative if you gave the show a ratings and review on iTunes. Trust me, it matters. And then also go share it with your friends, of course. Okay, until next week, go do something great. And remember, it takes a little more to make a champion. Bye.